I'm going to be looking at Joshua, a good soldier. I've been really thinking a lot about the book of Joshua and the character Joshua. And you want to make best friends with these Old Testament characters. Get to know them. Examine their life. Try to pick out the best things about them and try to get your life to line up with that. And then the bad things about them, try to get those things out of your life. But Joshua, he's just one of the greatest characters in all of the Bible. I think he's kind of an underrated character even. But you look at Joshua's life and Joshua pictures an outline of your spiritual life. And he's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at both of those things. So the character Joshua. The first thing about him was he was in the service of bondage. Joshua was in Egypt under the hard bondage of Pharaoh. Back there in Exodus 1, 13 through 14. You know, uh, Israel's in Egypt and Pharaoh is a a king over Egypt that knew not Joseph. And he puts the children of Israel in hard bondage. And it says in Exodus 1, 13 through 14, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they were made to serve wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. And this is a, a king that knew not Joseph. Joseph, also a picture of the Lord. Picturing serving a king that doesn't know the Lord. And that was the situation Joshua was in. He is in a situation where he is in the bondage of Egypt. He's in the service of bondage. Joshua was in, the, was in Egypt under the hard bondage of Pharaoh. And this would have made Joshua thick-skinned. He's a thick-skinned soldier. In Psalm 144 and verse 1 it says, Blessed be the Lord of my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. God puts you through things. He'll put you through the school of hard knocks to teach you some things. You'll learn some things. You'll learn how to be thick-skinned. You'll learn how to war. He'll teach your fingers to fight. Josh was in the service of bondage here. And you, you think about it like this, too. This, this is another way you can think about it. Here's the picture here. This is an outline of your spiritual life. There was a time when you were in the service of bondage to the flesh, the world, and the devil. Now, the devil's pictured by Pharaoh, a king that don't know the Lord. And Proverbs thirteen fifteen says, The way of transgressors is hard. You know, the Christian life is hard, but the way of transgressors is hard. And that's your life before you were saved. Under bondage of the flesh, the world, and the devil. You know, some of the meanest and toughest sinners will end up making the best Christians. God will use your wasted time in the world to get you thick-skinned for battle. You see, all this time that Israel was in Egypt, that Joshua was in Egypt, serving Pharaoh with rigor, and under that hard bondage, it was just making them thick-skinned warriors. The hard things you go through, it makes you tough. And if if you allow God, He will use that toughness in your spiritual life. Joshua is in the service of bondage here. Now, how can you see the Lord Jesus Christ in this? Well, you can see Him in everything in the Scriptures. You can see Jesus Christ in that He also came down and toiled in the flesh. You think about this in Mark 6, 3, it shows you his occupation when he was down here. 
It says, is not this the carpenter? The Lord Jesus Christ was a, a carpenter when he was in the flesh down here. You know, that's a hard job. He was toiling in the flesh. You know, when he was down here, he fasted for 40 days. Matthew 4, 2. When he was down here, he carried the cross. John 19, 17. When he was down here, he did not have good transportation. He walked everywhere that he went. Some say 20 miles a day even. He was thick-skinned, just like Joshua. Joshua is a great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Joshua, in the service of bondage, number two, he survived the plagues. Back there in Exodus, 7, Exodus 7 and verse 11, it says, Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments, and they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said, and then you get into the since Pharaoh hardened his heart, you get into the first plague with the water turned to blood. You know, and the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink. Against he come, and the rod which was turned to a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, And this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. You see that? There's your first plague, and Joshua survived the plagues. He would have seen the waters turn to blood. Joshua would have seen all the plagues with his own two eyes, witnessing the Lord's superiority over the gods of Egypt. You know, the Lord brought all these plagues against the false gods of Egypt, turned the water to blood, as you just seen. Brought the plague of frogs, lice, the moraine, the boils, the hell, the locusts, the darkness, the death of the firstborn. Joshua saw it and survived it. Now here's the picture. God miraculously brings you through the struggles of this dangerous world and the thousands of ways to die. You know, there's thousands of ways you could die today. Millions. Uh, he will also take you through the struggles of this dangerous world. And he'll also take you out before the tribulation if you're saved. You know, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. And he's going to preserve you to the day of the redemption of your body. But think about that for a minute. You're Joshua. You're serving. You're in the service of bondage. Every day you wake up and that alarm clock goes off. If they even let you sleep and you got to do this 16 hour shift all over again, no breaks, you know, nothing, just no benefits, just serving with rigor and hard bondage. And then this guy Moses shows up, your deliverer, and he's in this battle with your king, the wicked King Pharaoh, and you see all this stuff going on. The water turned to blood. The frogs, the lice, the moraine, the boils, the hell, the locusts, the darkness, and the death of the firstborn. You think about that. Joshua saw all of that. And this is the Lord preparing Joshua for something. Now, how do you see the Lord Jesus Christ in this? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ, just like Joshua, is a survivor. 
Joshua is a survivor. The Lord Jesus Christ is a survivor. You see, he had to willingly lay down his life or he never would have died. And you also see the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a deliverer from wrath. Joshua was delivered from all this wrath on Egypt. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10, it says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The Lord Jesus Christ is a deliverer from wrath. Just as he delivered Joshua during those plagues, he's going to deliver me from the tribulation. He's going to deliver me from hell. And the Lord Jesus Christ is a survivor. Joshua was a survivor. Now, number three, look at Exodus 12, 5 through 6. Let me show you something else that Joshua experienced. Exodus 12, 5 through 6, it says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the fifteenth, until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. You know what this is? This is the Passover. Joshua was in the service of bondage. Joshua survived the plagues. Joshua sacrificed a lamb you know his house would have had to sacrifice a lamb put the blood on the doorposts joshua would have applied the blood to his house you think about that not only did he see all those plagues but that last one he would have had to apply the blood to his house and something about joshua is joshua was the firstborn in his house. Think about the significance of that. Think about how important this shed blood of a lamb would have been to Joshua. If he didn't get that blood applied, then he would have died. He was the firstborn. Well, what's the picture? Well, we lived in bondage to the flesh world and the devil. And God was gracious enough to preserve you all the way up until the time when you got the blood of the lamb applied. Think about that. Colossians 1.14, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Acts 20.28, 20, It was God's blood that you got applied. Revelation 1.5, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. You got the blood applied. You were in service. You were in the service of bondage, serving the flesh, the world, and the devil. You survived all this trouble all the way up until you got the blood applied. You know, I, I hear a lot of people say they're so, they're so thankful to God that he allowed them to live and go through all this stuff until they could finally get the blood applied. You know, if you got saved late in life, God was gracious to you and not killing you before you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua was in the service of bondage, survived the plagues, and then lived all the way up until the time and got the opportunity to sacrifice a lamb and get the blood applied to his house. And he was the firstborn. He would have been getting it in the neck by the death angel if he didn't have that blood applied. And then how do you see the Lord Jesus Christ in this? Well, this one, very obvious. He is the lamb. You know, that chapter talked about a lamb, the lamb, your lamb. Jesus Christ is the lamb. John one thirty six. What did John the Baptist say about the Lord Jesus Christ? And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ is the Lamb without blemish and without spot. So Joshua, he is in the service of bondage. He survived the plagues. He sacrificed the Lamb. Number four, he stood still at the Red Sea. Look at Exodus 14, 
13 through 14. He says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Joshua saw those plagues, sacrificed the lamb. Now he, he's left Egypt, and now he's standing still at the Red Sea. Joshua would have witnessed one of the greatest miracles in all the scriptures that was known by everybody that put all the nations around him in fear. He would have been a part of and witnessed the Red Sea crossing. And it would have taught him that the Lord will fight his battles. And it would have taught him that he needs to wait on the Lord. You know, all these things in Joshua's life are leading up to something. Just like all the things in your life are leading up to something. If you will allow it. If you'll yield yourself to God. All the hard things. The hardships. The things that God's trying to teach you. It's all leading up to something. Joshua seeing all these things. And it's just nailing faith into his heart. He stood still at the Red Sea. What's the picture here? Well God will fight and make a way. In your life. And he will place you uh, between obstacles so that he can show out and increase your faith. You know, Joshua, just like the rest of the children of Israel, he was in this situation where he had the Red Sea in front of him on one side, and then he had Pharaoh and his army on the back side. So all he could do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, and this would have taught him to wait on the Lord. This would have taught him to stand still and let the Lord fight his battles. Now, how's the Lord Jesus Christ seen? Well, he also crossed bodies of water in a unique way. Look at Matthew 14. Matthew 14, 24 through 26. It says, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. You know, Joshua crossed waters in a unique way. The Lord Jesus Christ crossed waters in a unique way. See, so you see Jesus in everything. Now, number five, Joshua sang a new song. You know, Joshua made his way through that Red Sea. And then afterwards, he sings a new song. Just like you. You, uh, you were in the service of bondage to the flesh, the world, and the devil. You survived the plagues of your life. The Lord preserved you all the way up until the time. You, the sacrifice of the Lamb where you got the blood applied to your life. The Lord Jesus Christ. And then you stood still at the Red Sea. God had you go through, through some things to increase your faith. And now you're singing a new song. Hopefully you're singing a much different song than you were singing before you were saved. Just like Israel was doing in Exodus 15 too. And this is what Joshua would have been singing. The Lord is my strength and song. And he has become my salvation. He is my God and I will prepare him in habitation. My father's God and I will exalt him. Joshua was singing this new song. He was singing this song of Moses. Joshua and Israel sang the song of Moses after the Red Sea crossing. And what's the picture? After salvation, you've got a new song in your heart. Put spiritual songs in your heart. You know, what's the verses on this? Ephesians 5 and verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The main purpose for music is to give glory to God, to praise God. Colossians 3.16 
in Colossians 3, 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If the song makes you praise God and you're praising the Lord with the song, then that's good music. Somebody says, well, how do you know what's good music? Well, if the song makes you praise the Lord, it's praising God and it's making you praise God and it's not getting your fleshly appetites going, then that's how you know. And hopefully you're singing a new song. A song that doesn't bring you back to the service of bondage in Egypt. You know, there's songs that will bring you back to that bondage you was under as a lost man. And it will put you back in bondage to the flesh, the world, and, and the devil. You know, uh, a, a new song will remind you that you've been brought out of all this plagues of your life and now you're safe in the arms of the Savior. A new song will draw attention to the spotless lamb, that sacrifice lamb. A new song will remind you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You need to sing a new song. Now how's Jesus Christ seen in this? He is the new song. Look at Psalm 118 and verse 14. In Psalm 118 and verse 14, it says, The Lord is my strength and song, and is become my salvation. So he is the song. So you got a new song in your heart. Joshua had a new song in his heart. Now what's the next thing? Joshua, he survived all this stuff. He's got a new song in his heart. And he is a soldier in God's army. Number six, he's a soldier in God's army. You see, what in Joshua's life got him ready to be Moses' successor and a great type of Jesus Christ? All of these things that he's going through. Nothing was... Nothing was a waste here. He's a soldier in God's army. Look at Exodus 17. Exodus 17, 8 through 13. Now this is the fight with Amalek. The first war that Israel goes through after they leave Egypt is this fight with Amalek. Exodus 17, 8, it says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, a picture of the Lord Jesus. Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he set their own, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, and the one on the one side, and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down to the sun, and Joshua discomfited them. Or Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. What a great verse. Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. What a great picture here. Moses told Joshua to go out and fight with Amalek. So Joshua is a soldier in God's army. Quite possibly, back when he was in Egypt, Egypt probably had... Their slaves, Israel, Joshua, fight their battles too. So he was probably already experienced in war. 
And he's a soldier in God's army. And he's fighting with Amalek. Guess what Amalek is? A picture of the flesh. Look at Galatians 5, 16 through 17. This is one of your battles as a soldier in God's army. If you're saved, when you got saved, you automatically signed up to be a soldier. Now, whether or not you're actively fighting or not, that's up to you. But here's one of your battles. It says in Galatians 5, 16 through 17, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. When you got saved, you got two natures. You got a new man and you got an old man and they're always fighting. That's one of your battles. Fighting the flesh. Trying to shoot the flesh back down into the grave. Look at Romans seven eighteen through 25. Romans chapter 7, 18 through 25. Look at this battle. Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to, real, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. He says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So you see the battle. Paul was going through the flesh versus the spirit. You got Joshua, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You got Amalek, a picture of the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, and they're fighting. But look what it says there back in Exodus 7. Back in Exodus 7, or Exodus 17, rather. Exodus 17. And verse 13, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. He discomfited them. He made them uncomfortable. And he did it with the edge of the sword. Joshua pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. Amalek pictures the flesh. And he's got a sword. There's your word of God. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Joshua the Lord Jesus will take the sword, the word of God, and make the flesh uncomfortable and beat down the flesh. That's how you beat the flesh as a soldier in God's army. <clears throat> now, where were they at? In Exodus 17, 8, they fought with Israel in Rephidim. Rephidim is meaning place of rest. The flesh, the world, and the devil, they don't want you at rest. So then came Amalek. Then came the flesh. But Joshua discomfited Amalek with the edge of the sword. Hebrews 4.12, he's a good soldier in God's army. Well, so what's the picture? The picture for our life, we should make use of prayer and the word to war a good warfare. Second. Uh, Corinthians 10.4 talks about how the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Over in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18, it says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. You're a soldier in God's army. Joshua, a soldier in God's army. He wants us to war a good warfare. 2 Timothy 2, 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So that's the picture. Now how's the Lord Jesus Christ seen? As I've already talked about a little bit, Jesus Christ 
It was pictured by Joshua, and he's the one who fights for us. Joshua discomfited Amalek. The word of God, the living word, and the written word makes the flesh uncomfortable. It discomfited it. Uh, Exodus 15.3 calls the Lord himself a man of war. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Exodus 15 and verse 3. So he's a soldier in God's army. Number seven, Joshua has his senses exercised. You see, back there in Exodus 17, 8 through 13, Joshua had enough sense and discernment to know to follow Moses and who to choose to go out and to fight. You see, Joshua didn't just fight the battle, but Joshua chose out the men to fight with him. It says next to 17, 9, and Moses said unto Joshua, choose out men. You know, Joshua had his senses exercised. He had enough sense and discernment to know to follow Moses. He had enough sense and discernment to know who was the person to follow. And in Hebrews 5, 13 through 14, it says, for everyone that is for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Joshua knew who the right man to follow. Joshua knew the right pe people to choose to be in the army. So what's the picture? We need to have discernment to know who to follow and who to associate with. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1. Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You got enough sense to follow Paul? You got enough sense to follow a Bible-believing pastor? Do you got enough sense to know who to choose to fellowship with and to go out and fight battles with? Do you got your senses exercised? You, do you got enough sense to know which Bible to use? Now, how's the Lord Jesus Christ seen? He's seen in that he chooses the soldiers. In 2 Timothy 2.4, It says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Joshua chose soldiers to go out and fight with. He was the leader of the battle, but he chose out soldiers to go fight with him. Jesus Christ is our leader in the battle, but he chose you to go out and fight with him. He chose you to be a soldier. You see the picture? So Joshua, it's an amazing story. Joshua was, was in the service of bondage. He survived the plagues. He sacrificed the lamb. He stood still at the Red Sea. He sang a new song. He's a soldier in God's army. He has his senses exercised. And now number eight, he's stocked up on manna. You see the picture of your Christian life here? What happened after you got saved? You you started stocking up on manna. In Exodus 16, 13 through 18, it says, And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. For they wished not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and homer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. 
they gathered every man according to his eating. So they stocked up on manna. And you know who'd have, who would have been there during this? Joshua. Joshua would have stocked up on the manna. You see, the Lord rains down manna from heaven. And Joshua would have been there and partook in this miraculous event. He would have seen God supernaturally supply Israel with food. Look at these things Joshua has seen. All these things that's going to increase his faith more and more. Surviving the plagues. Seeing the Lord defeat the gods of Egypt. Going through the Red Sea. The fight with Amalek. And now he's stocking up on manna. Well, what's the picture for you? Well, every day, you got to go out and stock up on manna. You're going to need it. You're going to need to store it in your heart, store it in your remembrance and your memory so that he can bring it to the forefront of your mind. John 14, 26 talks about bringing all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. You're responsible for getting as much of this manna, this word of God in your head as you can so that God can bring it back to your remembrance. You're going to need to go out and gather it every day. And how's the Lord Jesus Christ seen? Well, he is the bread from heaven. And John chapter 6 and verse 51, it's Jesus himself said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then in John six fifty six. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. And he said in John 6, 58, This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Jesus is the true bread from heaven. That's the picture. The word of God is true bread from heaven as well. That's the picture. You got to stock up on manna every day. You got to get your daily uh, dose, your daily fix, your daily meal from the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to stack up on manna, just like Joshua did. Now, number nine, Joshua scaled Mount Sinai with Moses. A lot of people don't think about this, but did you know that Joshua scaled Mount Sinai with Moses? You know, Moses was a mountain climber. Joshua is a mountain climber. Exodus 24, 12, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua. And Moses went up into the mount of God, and he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us, until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights, but he wasn't alone. It said back there in verse 13, And Moses rose up, and his minister, Joshua. And Moses went up into the Mount of God. He scaled Mount Sinai with Moses. Joshua went up with Moses up Mount Sinai when Moses received the Ten Commandments. This shows Joshua took no part in that worshiping of the golden calf that you see over there in Exodus 32, 16 through 17. Exodus 32, 16 through 17. And you see that Joshua's coming back down with Moses at this point. It says, And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was a the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp 
And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. You know, Joshua thought it was a noise of war going on in the camp when they were down there worshiping that golden calf. But Moses is like, no, this is the sound of them that sing. We see to Joshua, he was living a separated life. He was singing a new song in his heart. So when he heard what Israel was doing, he thought, well, this is the noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, this is them, the noise of them that sing. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mountain. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it up upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Joshua would have seen all that. Joshua scaled Mount Sinai with Moses. He would have been up there for 40 days and 40 nights and I'm assuming he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm not, I'm not certain. But it's an amazing thing. He scaled Mount Sinai with Moses. What's the picture? Stay on the narrow way and you won't be brought down by the way of transgressors. Proverbs thirteen fifteen. What does it say about this? Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. You know, if Joshua wouldn't have been up there with Moses... He would have been tempted to go along with that golden calf worship. Stay on the narrow way. The Lord, How's the Lord Jesus Christ seen? Separate from sinners. You know, Joshua wasn't with them while all this was going on. Hebrews 7.26, it says, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Joshua was separate from sinners. The Lord Jesus Christ was separate from sinners. Number 10, spirit-filled. Joshua was spirit-filled. Deuteronomy 34, 19. Deuteronomy 34. Or actually, Numbers 27, 18. And Numbers 27 and verse 18 it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. You know, Joshua wasn't sealed by the Holy Spirit. They weren't sealed in the Old Testament like we are. You know, me and you, when we got saved, we were sealed until the day of redemption. But Joshua is said to have the Spirit. He's spirit filled how about you does the spirit live in you how's the lord jesus christ seen well god giveth not the spirit by measure unto him in him dwelleth all the fullness of the godhead bodily you know God, jesus said if you've seen me you've seen the father in him dwelleth all the fullness of the godhead bodily the Lord Jesus Christ was spirit-filled. He giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. How about you, though? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you have the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory? If not, then you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have the Holy Spirit. But you have the spirit of disobedience in you. You know, if you're not saved, you're going through a service of bondage. You're stuck to the flesh, the world, and your father is the devil. And up to this time, you've survived the plagues. God has preserved you up to this time because he's long-suffering. He's long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you need to come to the Lamb of God. You know, just as Joshua, he sacrificed the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, he got the blood applied, you need to get the blood applied. You see, you're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what that means is, you've done some bad stuff. 
And it's more than just killing somebody. It's lying, cheating, stealing, talking back to your parents. You've sinned. All have sinned. And those sins is what separated you from God. And there's only one man that can get you back to God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God himself. And he knew that you couldn't live good enough on your own. So he came down in the flesh as a man. He was fully God and fully man. And he lived a sinless life. And he voluntarily died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood on the cross for you. He was buried for you. And then he resurrected. That means he got up out of the grave for you three days later. And he, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. And now he's offering salvation to you. You see, you sinned. Your sin separated you from God. But it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ became your sin when he was on the cross. And when they was nailing him to that cross and he was up there suffering, he was paying the payment for your sin. You see, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All those sins you've committed, there's a payment for them. You would have to pay for them if you don't get saved. But when Jesus Christ was on the cross, he paid for the sins for you. Now, he's offering to, to, to pay for them. And you just, all you got to do is accept the payment. He's, it's like he's just holding out the check, signed in his blood, and he's like, Take it. Accept the payment. And you just got to take the payment. Now, how do you do that? Well, it says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to know anything other than that you sinned against God. You know you're a sinner. You know that your sins have separated you from God. And you know that your sins are going to take you to hell if you don't get them paid for. Jesus Christ already paid for them, but you got to accept the payment and they're paid for and they're gone forever once you accept the payment. So you come to Jesus Christ right now. Do it right now. Don't put it off. Come to him right now as the guilty sinner that you are. And just like the night I got saved, I said, God, I know I'm a sinner and I know I'm going to hell, but I don't want to go to hell. I know you paid the price for my sin on the cross. I know you shed your blood and I know you were buried and resurrected. And I want to put my trust in that to be saved and to go to heaven. And the moment I said that, even right before I said that, I, I believed in my heart to salvation. See, it's not a magical prayer that saves. It's what take pla takes place in your heart. That's how you get saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ.